All right, welcome to another episode of the Off the Doors podcast. Uh, today we have with us Mr. Ryan Olson. Ryan, hey. uh, actually, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan though because he has the best intro voice I've ever heard. Ryan, why don't you give us an intro? Here like we go. a little hey, buddy. <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, the, the, which one do you want, bud? Do you want, like, the, 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 no, the infomercial one? Or oh, what? yeah, the infomercial so, one. So what do, you want me to, what do you want me to say here? I'll, uh, I'll just say next. what I just said. Welcome to the podcast, Off the Doors, blah, 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 and just uh, just well, let everybody hear your amazing infomercial voice. So I would say something like, welcome to the podcast, the Off the Doors podcast, brought to you by Caliber, <laughs> sponsored by Ian Went. <laughs> welcome to the podcast. Oh, I love it. It's awesome. Um, for those of you guys that don't know who Ryan is, I will give a beef, a, a beef, a brief background. Uh, we, I like eating a beef I, background. I, I like eating beef. You do like eating beef. I mean, it's good. You love the beef. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Ryan Olson is, uh, the VP of sprint over here at caliber. And what's interesting is he actually came from the retail space, owned 20 stores, I believe yeah. in Idaho and Wyoming, which is like probably the toughest network to own a sprint store in yeah and uh somehow continue to still crush it right we crushed it uh and then all of a sudden decided to come over to the door-to-door industry and basically pioneer the first ever door-to-door campaign for cell phones yeah which has obviously taken off and we're extremely successful with it as a matter of fact right now even though we're not knocking full-time i think we're doing like a thousand what are we doing right now? Yeah, we'll hit we'll, this month, uh, not even knocking, going with our uh, digital marketing that we launched. We're yeah. probably going to end up about 1,400 lines. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's pretty nuts. That's that's crazy. And, uh, and since then, obviously, you've been pivotal in making sure, or, or not in making sure, but it, just basically in the success of this program, I would say. Uh, yeah. How many people call you every day with questions? I mean, you've been around me quite a bit, so you <laughs> you kind of get an idea of who calls me. the The crazy thing is, is uh, the type of personality that I have. Like, I have to answer my phone. So yeah, I you mean, do. I, I can't even tell you. Actually, you know who you should ask that question to is my wife. Uh, she would be able to Kim, tell you exactly Kimberly. how many times I've answered my phone because okay. she's like, "Dude, get off the phone." <laughs> but yeah, so a lot. A lot, a lot of calls, but you know what? A lot of calls means they have a lot of questions, and the more questions we answer, the faster we can build. So love it. Well, so the so it's pretty it's pretty impressive. You basically came into the door to door industry and did something that no one has ever done, uh, and arguably made the biggest rift or biggest uh, ripple, I guess, in a, in a pretty big pond with something that just literally was nobody had ever even thought about taking cell phones to the doors, or maybe they did, but obviously they didn't do it. Sure. So. You're the first one to do it. I think uh, one of the main reasons we wanted to have you on the podcast today was because I believe, I know you really well, and I believe that what has made that possible is your like relentless positivity and determination to just not be negative. And I personally wanted to just kind of dive into why you are that way, because most people cannot sustain the amount of energy and positivity that you do. Sure. And uh, I think it's important to talk about all the things that people don't know about Ryan Olson. But I just want to start off by first talking about the story about how Ryan and I met. So the very first time we ever met was in Mike Hammond's office. And Mike Hammond basically brought me in and said, hey, uh, this is Ryan Olson. And he's going to be running the Sprint program over here. We're going to be selling cell phones door to door. And you came in, you're like, Ian went. You're my favorite new person. Here's the cell phone plan. Here's how we're going to roll it out, and you just need to get on board. You're going to love it. It's going to be the best. And I'm like, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> There's no way. You got oh, you got Verizon, gosh. bro? You got Verizon? Who do you have? Who do you have? I'll save you a ton of money. What do you want to do? What kind of phone do you want? Do you want a new phone? Uh, how about oh. we get you switched over right now? Let's get you switched over right now. You know, you can even use another phone if you I'm like, what in the? No. <laughs> Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And uh, yeah, I was at first I was kind of like, who the freak is this guy? Good hell. What's going to happen with my life now? And uh, what's interesting is I actually did make that switch. And it was after you and I, I don't remember if it was before or after. I can't remember. But anyway, it was before or after you and I actually went out during uh, the competition we used to run as a company, Execs vs. the World, where we would all go out as executives and basically kind of prove to the young bucks that the old dogs still had it right we freaking threw we freaking smoked it through down uh i believe it was one street and we did 
uh, was it twelve dish and twenty seven sprint lines? Yes, something like that. It was that. It was that nuts, and it, it was literally one street. It was like fourteen homes or something crazy. I think we had seven dish and like twelve sprint lines by one o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, and we started knocking at like what eleven. You know what's crazy about that experience? Like that. That was the first time, one of the first times that I've ever been out knocking where like we had to get it done. What I mean by that is. I, oh yeah. I, I pressure was on. Pressure was on. I, I hadn't come from the door to door industry knowing what to do. Yeah. So this was like my first go. Yeah. And this is where we just barely had the systems figured out. Yeah. And I remember knocking with you, dude. And it was like, is it really this easy? Like, <laughs> is, is, is this all we do? Well, dude, I remember the same thing. I remember thinking, cause I, at first I was kind of like, well, all right, let's see how this goes. Let's see if we can just attach a few lines here and there. And then it was like, Every single one of my sales was like five lines, five lines, five lines. And I'm like, first of all, how much money we were making in one day. I was uh, like, I just like, cha-ching, 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 cha-ching. I'm like, whoo, this is incredible. Uh, I remember literally thinking I will never, ever sell another dish account without attaching at least three lines to it. Like, it was just stupid. It yeah. was absolutely ridiculous. What was cool about it is uh, you, you've been in the industry a long time and, and door knocking, doing what you do. So you were like the master expert at getting in the home and actually closing the deal down. What I'm a master expert at is selling cell phones. So it was easy because you went in, sold the deal on why they needed Dish Network. Yeah. And it was, my transition was, okay, cool. And you need this too. And they're like, okay, like every time. So For sure. And you had the nuts. system down. Cause at the time, dude, our system was booty. Like yeah. it took what, two hours, I think yeah. to process an account. Like it was absolutely ridiculous. But with you, it was like, nope, 20 minutes. Yeah. Like, oh, this is a problem. Cool. We'll solve it. Yeah. And I feel like that's why we actually crushed it. You know, we always talk about like the biggest difference between a rookie rep and a, and a seasoned veteran or someone who's just, you know, constantly throwing down is, is literally just the, the ability. It's the experience. It's the anticipation like duh. Right. For sure. The thing about it though, was there literally wasn't a single concern that they could give us with dish that we couldn't answer. And there wasn't a single concern with sprint that we couldn't answer. And so that just, it was the perfect storm. But anyway, it, it, it definitely opened my eyes. And I think from there on, it just kind of took off, uh, for me personally. And then dude, I mean, ever since then we've gone f leaps and bounds for sure. Like what, it, what do we right now, since we started, what are we at number wise? So we, last year we hit almost 45,000 lines. Uh, this Huge. year we'll probably hit right around 75,000 lines. Crazy. Is kind of where we're training to go. So it's nuts, dude. Uh, it, it was, you know, just like anything in life, like honestly coming from the outside in, um, man, it, it was tough because you know, I, I don't know if you remember, yeah. but it was like, oh yeah, well that's how we do it in retail or that's, that's not how we do it in door to door. Yep. Oh, well, that's, that's how you do it in retail. Yep. I was like, it was just constant like battle back and forth. But honestly, the, the crazy thing that happened is once our leaders in our organization actually got it, it took off. It freaking took off but yeah. dude it was literally took two, a minute two months yeah three months six months and that probably felt like an eternity oh dude it was it was it was nuts yeah bro. yep i remember that it's it's pretty crazy it's cool to see where we are now but anyway so that just kind of give you some background about how ryan and i met and, and everything uh but i want to now i want to really dive into uh that that the whole idea of this podcast which is i want to talk about what you've experienced in your life as far as adversity goes. Sure. And I think we're going to talk about some pretty crazy things that a lot of you guys just have zero clue about Ryan Olson and uh, he's full of yeah. surprises, but uh, what that has done and, and why that has actually made you who you are today. Because again, one of the most positive, like upbeat, enthusiastic dudes anybody's ever met. Right. And so let's start back at the beginning. You and I kind of talked a little bit about this, but as a kid, you weren't poor but you also weren't like super well off and correct me if I'm wrong, but you, t you basically talked about how throughout your childhood, you were constantly s surrounded by negative people. And you know uh, what that kind of does to us, uh, you know, I, I have things for myself and I know other people struggle with the same thing. Like when you grow up in a certain situation, whatever that situation is, you kind of like form this lens that you see the world through. Yeah. And so I'm assuming um, that you being constantly surrounded by negative people. So first of all, you had two options, right? You could have either, either like fed on that and kind of like continue to be negative yourself and, and allowed yourself to be surrounded, 
or you can, you know, flight or fight, right? Sure. You fought against it. And, uh, and so I'm assuming that because of that, because the negativity was so overwhelming, you kind of just decided that's not going to be me. And you can literally see that to this day. Anybody that knows Ryan, like you run from negativity 100%, which is a great thing, right? But I want to talk about uh, why, you know, why you run so far from it, because sure. I think that's something powerful for everybody. Yeah. And what it, what, it com- what it comes down to is like when you're surrounded by that all your life, it's the type of feeling that it's like either I'm going to be like them or I'm going to be somebody else. Yeah. And as I started going through life, I mean, like I said, I wasn't poor by any means, but our family wasn't wealthy either. Um, mm-hmm. You know, like I say this, like during baseball season, for example, like I would get uh, a pair of cleats that would fit me for two years. Yeah. I would get a baseball mitt that would have to last me four years. And maybe it was just then that's just what you did. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't like, you know, hey, mom and dad, I need new baseball cleats every year. They're like, can't afford it. Like you're going to have to get these ones. Yeah. I pay less shoes. Yeah. Right. But. I always had everything I needed. We had dirt bikes growing up. They weren't brand new, but we had dirt bikes. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't like a crazy financial struggle. No, it wasn't crazy. But your your real struggle was in the atmosphere. Like what yeah. what would I mean, give us some examples. What were sure. some of the examples that you can remember right off the top of your head that just like that's the negativity that I ran from? Sure. I think if if you look at life as a whole, like you have the people that are you know, super poor, you have the people that are doing okay, and then you have the people that are just wealthy, right? And mm-hmm. In sports, especially, the, it seems like the people that have that are wealthy have everything they need. So one thing that I, I was on that lower scale, right? But I was super talented in sports. Um, but I was just always battered by coaches, always. Mm. Interesting. Um, just do this better, do that better. You need to go here. You need to do there. You can't play this. You can't play that. And so it was just it was just constant negativity. I really didn't have much negativity in the home life. Mm-hmm. Um, that was actually pretty positive but just everything in in sports in uh anything i was doing outside was super negative i mean it was it was pretty bad yeah um to the point to where i figured out like i i can either go down that path and and be negative and not grow or i can change people's perspectives because of the way i am because i can literally go talk to anyone i mean when i was a kid i used to go when we were fishing we would be uh, going down the river and there'd be this one hole where everyone's at. Most people would shy away from that and be like, dude, I'm not, there's 9 million people over there. I, I just roll down there. I'm like, Hey guys, what's up? And I would just go and get in and pretty soon they're giving me stuff to use and let me reel and fish. Like that's just how my personality has always been. Um, but it's, it's, it's been crazy to see the reaction that you get, um, going down the negative path. Cause that's the easy thing to do. Most people yeah. will follow that yeah. because it's easy, yep. but I didn't like the feeling. The feeling to me was weird. So I always just went above and beyond to just make people happy, excited, um, and just do different things. So yeah, it's, again, it's, it's difficult. It was probably the most difficult thing I've ever done is, is overcoming that fight against that. Yeah. But because I did it, it totally changed my life. Yeah. And that, so that brings us to, uh, the, I, I think the next like most interesting thing about you and it makes sense why you did this like uh, so you were a full-time videographer for Steve's Outdoor Adventure yeah. I believe is what it was called and it was that was a show on it's on the Outdoor Channel on Outdoor it's Channel still on the Outdoor Channel you yeah. basically traveled the world and went through some of the craziest experiences yep. and shot this video for this this guy in this this TV program right so so many people don't know that about you, yeah. but it makes sense that you did something like that because it's like adventure, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of like your way of getting away from everything. I feel like sure. correct me if I'm wrong, but that's probably what a lot of what that was, where it's like, I just want to do something awesome and like kind of fulfill a dream. But also I just want to get away from everything and just be on my own. It's my happy place. Yeah. You're what, to this day. Yeah. To this day, I, I go to the mountains, I ride horses, I go hunting it's literally my reset. Like yeah. I can go do that. And I'm like, life is freaking legit. Yeah. Yeah. But that experience wasn't all like roses. Like you had some pretty yeah, man. gnarly. Uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about that? I, I think you start with the freaking grizzly bears. Yeah. So, I mean, so working with uh, Steve's Outdoor Adventures and, and going all over the world, we went all over the world. So it wasn't just the United States, Canada, Mexico, Africa, all over the world. Um, we, the, the craziest thing that, well, it's not the craziest, it's one of the craziest things is, uh, yeah, the grizzly bear experience. So we were actually in Alaska. 
um, filming a grizzly bear hunt. And we actually, as we were, we were always in the midst of bears because that's what we're doing. We're hunting grizzly bears, but mm-hmm. we needed to find like that one grizzly bear. And anyways, we ended up getting a little, uh, in a, in a bad situation with some cubs with a mama, mama grizzly. And, uh, Not good. yeah, it basically got one of our hunters. Ooh. Uh, we actually didn't get it on film, but we were in the scrub oak going through to cross this river and we didn't know that these uh, grizzly bears were there. And anyways, it ended up getting the hunter, dragging him into the river. No way. Yeah. and You uh, watched this happen. Yeah, watched it happen. Just mauled this dude. Mauled this dude. Uh, dragged him right into the river. Was pushing him up and down in the river. But anyways, obviously we... Just like washing a towel. It was crazy, like, dude. <laughs> Holy crap. But, uh, and the crazy part is, is so that whole ordeal went down. Yeah. Um. We obviously did what we had to do to get the grizzly bear off of him. Well, what did you have? Hold on. Go back up. <laughs> so you're watching this grizzly bear basically taking this dude and, like, just washing him through, in the river. Through the oak brush because it's really thick. Yeah. So we're, like, all of a sudden we hear screaming, and we're, like, what the freak? And all of a sudden grizzly bear's dragging the dude out in the river and just freaking roar, roar, like. And you just – so you run over. So, yeah. So I'm, like – I'm looking for our guy. I just immediately think of like the Revenant. Have you seen that movie? Yeah, it's nuts. Yeah, it's nuts. Anyway, so okay. Yeah, so anyways, I'm like looking around, like what the freak's going on? Everyone's screaming, and then the guide starts shooting, and then anyways, so yeah, we ended up <laughs> taking care of that bear, but just, just shot him. That yeah. was it. I mean, tr- yeah, it was. They were trying to shoot the bear, but they was he was mauling the dude too, so like it was weird. But he got the 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 guide was legit, dude. He freaking just walked out in the river and was like bam like really you're out bear what was the guy like i mean what happened to the guy so yeah they had to they actually had to life flight him he his head was all jacked up and bleeding it was Jeez. it was nuts the crazy part about that is is so i was like that was my first experience of like this is nuts right like i don't want to be here <laughs> yeah, like you're stuck you're starting a second thing like uh, i'm like this is nuts but <laughs> But I get, and this the mean coach wasn't yeah, so it, bad. <laughs> this this isn't a typical experience. Like typically, yeah. you don't get yourself in those situations. It right. just was a bad situation, being in the wrong place at the wrong time. The guy ended up being fine, um, but we still we didn't leave. Like the, we had other hunters yeah. in the area, and so we just camped like a mile from there. Right after that, yes, like that we just were there. So in at night filming grizzly bears. Yeah. We'll so they're try, all around you. Yeah, we're just trying to get a hunt done with a grizzly bear on for Steve's Outdoor Adventure. That's yeah. insane. Yeah. So anyways, at night, the grizzly bears obviously can smell right real well. They would come around the tent and they I don't know if you know a grizzly bear, but they'd do like a little huff like, <laughs> like right by your face. Oh my we're God. like, hey bear, hey bear, gun, hey bear, get out of here, bear, hey bear. And that would scare them off. Typically, sometimes they'd just be like, whatever. But that's you just sleeping right there, grizzly bear at your head. Yeah, pretty much. So I had to. It's nuts. I mean, you just had to think positive, like, <laughs> like I got, okay. I got a gun, and so th- I don't know. It's kind of a, th- it's kind of weird. But a thing that I'd always do is I'd be, I'd in my mind, I would just be like, I got a gun, so like, bring it on, dude. Come through the tent. Like, you want, you want some? Come through the tent. And I had to like talk myself into it, but I didn't sleep very much. <laughs> Yeah, I bet. But, I mean, experiences weren't always crazy like that, but that was probably one of the craziest. Well, it was. So you but you had another one, too, with a horse. Did yeah. you not? Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I'm an avid hunter, right? Yeah. So, um, again, we, we go into some crazy places. So, yeah, I've, I've actually, we were going up uh, to this peak, up to this trail, and we had to cross this big uh, crossing along this trail. It wasn't really a trail, but it was like a little ravine. And the horse I was on had a bunch of camera gear on it, and it slipped and started rolling down the mountain. You on it? Yeah. Oh, I was talking about the horse getting mauled by the grizzly bear, but okay, oh, cool. Yeah, another horse story. That's another one, yeah. But, yeah, it started rolling down the mountain. So, and my foot actually got caught in the stirrup, and as I was rolling, it was – luckily, we were – it was in snow – but so it wasn't like all the pressure on me, but we started tumbling down the mountain and about halfway down. It was, I think it was like an 800 foot roll. Holy my foot came out and then the horse rolled down and then stood up and was like, Oh, what was that? So that's pretty lucky. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Luckily, Jeez. luckily there was snow, right? Jeez. Okay. So let's keep on going with these stories. Cause they just get, uh, 
they just get funner, more fun, I guess. Is uh, so the next one you told me about was the frostbite. Okay. Yeah. You want to talk about the frostbite? I mean, one? yeah. What, like, I, I've been in pretty cold places, but sure. I don't think I've ever dealt with what you have. Yeah. So part of my experience, so again, we travel all the world. I did it for about three years. It was a cool experience. Like, again, we were talking about uh, adversity and different things, but we went up to the North Pole uh, and we were hunting muskox. So up there in the North Pole at the time of the year we were up there, it's not unusual to be negative 50 to 72, negative 72 degrees. So when we, when we got there, uh, we got all of our gear. We had to have boots that had like, I don't even know, uh, six inches of padding so that the air capacity wouldn't get up to your feet. It's like, I can't remember what the boots, moon boots is what they call them. Wow. Um, we had to have wear special suits, special hats, special gloves. Cause basically what happens is, is when it's that cold, um, if any part of your skin touches air without anything on your face, it just immediately turns white. It's burning your skin. Basically that's how cold it was. So we had to go get a musk ox. That's part of what we need to do for the television show. So away we went, we went, instead of doing it on dog sleds, we did it with, it's called a, uh, I'm trying to think of what it's called now. It's a, it's like a dog sled, but it's pulled behind a snowmobile, like a, uh, I can't even remember what it's called, mm -hmm. like a tuk tuk or okay. some weird name. Okay. But anyways, uh, they pulled up behind a snowmobile instead of uh, sled dogs, and we would just sit in this little hut with a little windshield, and they would pull us across the tundra, and we'd be going across the tundra for four, five, six, sometimes seven hours, getting to where we we're going to hunt. Just wide open, wide open nothingness. Nothing. Wow. Like it's tundra in the middle of the winter. So yeah, the crazy part about that is. It was freezing. It was the craziest experience I've ever had, number one, because it was literally so – it's just sitting like this for hours, just going – just bouncing around. And then I had to film stuff, and a lot of the times when I would go to film, the camera would freeze solid. It, it would stop recording. So I'd have to tuck it in my coat and try to get it warmed back up so it would actually record. But, yeah, there was one time where I, I didn't notice, but my face mask was kind of down on the side of my cheek. Well, this whole area right here turned – bright white because my skin was burning I was so cold I freaking had no idea right so the Inuit guide that's who we have as Inuit guides out there he came up he had this big huge glove on made out of probably musk ox hair I'm not sure pulled off his his hand and if I did that if I pulled off my glove and went like this instant burning like burning sensation he put his hand over my face to get my blood flowing back in my in my skin basically that's how cold it was so it was uh it was nuts we did not go out when it was negative 72, uh, we stayed in these little huts with oil burning stoves, but it was easily negative 30, negative 40 when we were out filming. And, uh, it was the craziest thing I've ever done. It was nuts. It's nuts. In fact, the most, the most cra crazy, the craziest thing that I think happened in that scenario with me was we, we ended up getting a musk ox in the middle of nowhere, mind you, like nothing around. Yeah. And 30 seconds later, four wolves come up over the mountain. And start running into the musk ox to eat it. What? And so the guy that I was with, Steve, I, we were filming. Literally, he was sitting there with the animal filming, doing a, uh, an overview of what happened with the hunt. And I look to my left, and there's a freaking four wolves, like 10 <laughs> feet from him. One white one and three black ones. And I'm like, I looked at it. He saw my face. I didn't even say anything. He saw my face, and I was like, and he looked, and he's like, Oh my! He's grabbed his gun, <laughs> smoked one of the wolves, and then the other ones ran off. And we, the Inuits, chased them ones down, and we ended up getting two more. <laughs> Holy crap! But that was pretty. That was it, was. it was like all of a sudden, me and you were talking, and also we looked Just over wolves. Wolves, like <laughs> what's up? Oh. Nuts! Oh my gosh, yeah, dude! So that that uh, that experience was very, and it it, it was very difficult because there was a lot of things that I could have been like. F this. This is stupid. I can't believe I'm out here, but I, I had to I had a job Just I had to do. It, yeah. Yeah, it was crazy. So we'll get to that. We'll get to why that is important. But last story I want you to talk about is the airplane crash. Okay. Because apparently you crashed in an airplane <sighs> well, as well. We didn't crash. Oh, okay. But we should have crashed. Okay. Yeah, so we uh we take off. Uh, this is in Alaska, so maybe I just need to stay away from Alaska. Yeah, apparently Alaska's not good to It was in Alaska. We, fl we fly in a lot of these uh, small planes, uh, bush planes is what they call them. But anyways, we 
and I've I've done it, it thousands of times. So this it was like just getting in a car one day. What? But we got in the plane and <clears throat> we took off, and they have these big bush wheels on these planes, so you can land basically anywhere in the bush. Well, we take off and we're flying, and the pilot's like, uh, yeah, uh, and he talks in like the little pilot. He's like, yeah, made a one four six two one nine er. We need an emergency landing, like because I have my he- headset in. I'm like, emergency landing. Like, <laughs> he didn't say any. He no, didn't say anything to you. Not a so word. So you're just like, wait, huh? What? He's like, yeah, d- and they talk in like the uh, airplane voice, like, yeah, Delta one two Frank Niner. We have an emergency landing. Uh, we're like, it was just, it was like crazy. <laughs> like it was like I was in a movie. And, I'm, and then all of a sudden, uh, our guy's like, emergency landing. Well, what's going on? He's like. Yeah, if uh, you look down to the right, uh, that we, we do not have a wheel on the right-hand <laughs> side of the <laughs> aircraft. Uh, looks like the wheel fell off uh, as we took off. Uh, we need to find a place to land. We're like, uh, okay. So we got four dudes in this plane. Just nonchalant. We uh, we lost a wheel. Yeah, we lost a, a wheel. If you look <laughs> down on the bottom right-hand side, you'll notice that the Tundra wheel <laughs> is no longer there. I was like, He's totally calm. Uh, totally calm. Like, no big deal. Like, th- like this happens all the time. And I'm like... <laughs> We're going to die. <laughs> but instead of like freaking out saying we're going to die, I'm like, because the guys, some guys were freaking out. I'm like, dude, chill, bro. Like this guy, that's what this, this, what this guy does for a living. Yeah. He fly. It's like him driving a car. He'll just land us on one side of the wheel <laughs> and then we'll just slowly stop. Yeah. Like we'll be good. And they're flipping out, dude, like freaking out. So anyways, it's one of those times where I'm like, dude, we're good. Like, and the guy was like, yeah, we're good. We're good. The pilot was doing the same thing. We're good. We're good. Trying to calm people down. So anyways, we go and he's like, all right, everyone, he's, he told us to uh, brace ourselves. He's like, I want you to put your heads down, cross your arms, and just ho- and just hold yourself as tight as you can as we land. Because he's like, I don't know how hard we're going to hit, but he's like, I'm going to make this as soft as possible. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so anyways, so we, we, ended up, we ended up landing on a, a gravel bar, and he actually did an amazing job. So what he did is he came down out of the air, and he put his wheels on the water to slow us down. And then we basically hit the gravel bar, but where we uh, where were, it wasn't actually rocks. It was sand. So it was actually like we just kind of was like landed, and we just kind of went <laughs> and then stopped. And so we actually ev- did, yeah, that's everyone was fine. Um, everyone thought they were going to die, but – we we didn't die. Wow. So it was a crazy experience. So, okay, so all these experiences that you had as a as a videographer, obviously this is like some of the craziest uh, places that you can be. And I, and I mean, I'm sure words don't do it justice at all, like at all. You're probably, you know, I can only imagine. And uh, so many people would find a way to just – be negative about it right just be pissed about where they're at or why it doesn't make sense to be there or you know what the conditions are or whatever and uh that adversity that you face there didn't stop just as a videographer did it no continued throughout the life yeah so i mean part part of uh and again we're talking about crazy things that that have happened but we talk about like hunters flying in to go on these different hunts like yeah they wanted uh, most of the time they wanted this kosh push this easy let me go find an animal hunt right mm-hmm. and real world that's not real so there was a lot of negativity there we're like i can't believe this and i can't it was just it was just constant negativity right like oh we have to ride another 12 miles or oh we're gonna sleep here oh how come we can't find animals over here oh it was just everything always negative so i just figured out a way to just I don't know, dude. You know me. It, you you could come at me negative, yeah. and it's like instant, like you, something positive. Yeah, I don't there's, know why. There's no excuses. No, it doesn't it's, matter. Yeah, it's it's like it like literally negative negativity doesn't exist. Um, I actually and at I, all. And Sometimes actually, it can actually be like a it, yeah a bad thing. It can because some people are like, dude, it's like, like unrealistic. Like, dude, Ryan, can you like? I get it, bro. But can you like be real? And I'm yeah, like, yeah, I, I am real. Yeah, and then once I explain it, they're like, "Oh, that actually makes sense." But sometimes it's like it's not even real. You just have a different way of seeing everything. Everything. And I, again, I think that's why, I think why this episode is important is because it's all these things that have that you've gone through where you've had to see it differently. You've had to force yourself to see it differently, and it all came again from your childhood of like saying, "Hey, I'm not going to see this the way that everybody else wants me to see it," and you chose to 
see everything from a different lens, even to the point where, uh, you know, you, you told me about your divorce and like what happened there. Yeah. And that wasn't just like a, Hey, we fought and we didn't get along. That was like something that probably could have easily took anybody down a really, really dark path. Yeah. But you didn't go down that path. I mean, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, we could talk about that. I can tell you that uh, that was the hardest thing I've ever had to go through in my entire life. When you want to talk about people getting to their lowest lows, you know, because they talk about people getting down to, you know, what do they call it? Ground zero or your lowest low. Like, yeah, rock bottom. Rock bottom. That's yeah. exactly what I was looking for. I was there. I think what helped me, though, get through that, because it wasn't just a divorce. It was a divorce with a family business that yeah. we had, you know, the Sprint stores with all of my family. Yeah. So my family was heavily involved in that. Yeah. Um, it was, I had two kids. It was, it was, it was a nightmare. It was literally a nightmare. But what I found was the situation of, instead of diving into it and being the most negative person and finding everything that went wrong... I looked at what I can do differently next time and what I can do to secure the situation I'm in and give it the best result. Now, that's a hard thing to do when you have emotion and feelings. Because when you have emotion and feelings, you don't think that way. You, all you care about is getting, getting the result, right? Because it's hard to explain, but when you have emotion and feelings, every other aspect of life goes away. Right. Like, yeah. you don't think straight. Your logic goes out the window. So, so me saying I need to be positive before is easy, but now it's not easy because logically you should be upset. I should be freaking going nuts. Which, but that's why like logic comes in and says, dude, I should be pissed. Yeah. I sh like, I have every right to be pissed. Logically, I have every right to be mad. Sure. Right. But you need to balance that between logic and emotion. And so how did you do that, Ryan? Honestly, because, because dude, I've. I've been down, you know, obviously both of us are in way better spots right now. Sure. And it's like we dodged huge bullets, right? But I've been in that situation too where I personally, I mean, I wasn't, I didn't get divorced. But like I dated a girl for over a year, you know, came down to it. And uh, long story short, you know, she she had had a ton of problems with like relationships. And her dad left her when she was 10. And everybody she knew had broken relationships. And so she was damaged when it came to sure. relationships. But, uh, about a year into the relationship, she basically said, Hey, like, I'm ready. I, I was being really patient. Right. She was like, I'm ready to get, you know, married. And I was like, she's like, she actually told me she bought a dress. She was in Ecuador on a study abroad and I was out selling and out of the blue, she's like, I bought a dress. And I'm like, well, uh, excuse me. Okay. Uh, you mean to like go on a date? Yeah. I was like, all, all right. Uh, yeah. what kind of dress? Right. Anyway. So long story short, she comes back. She's the one again, right? She's the one that's been reluctant. She's the one that's now telling me, Hey, I'm ready. She comes out. I plan this whole big thing. I kid you not, dude. I'm talking like lit up stones. I put glow sticks on stones by a nice little like river. I mean, I went all out, bro. Yeah. Had all the people there. We filmed it, everything got down on a knee, asked. She said, no, I kid you not. Bro. You're she like, said, you're no. like, excuse me. She said, I'm not ready. And yeah. I'm just like, you, well, excuse me you're not yeah, but you, you dress you're the one yeah white so, dress so anyway dude i i get like again i didn't go through a divorce so it's not nearly as comparable but i do remember that was probably one of the lowest lows of my life and it was it wasn't just because of the feeling of like you know the hurt that i had because of the relationship oh and then by the way th uh three days later she cheated on me with another dude anyway that, that, that's the I worst. Digress. But no, but like it wasn't like uh, it wasn't just that hurt though. It was also from a spiritual standpoint. I I have uh, a really strong faith that you know God is always there for me. He's and He's always has my best interests. Well, dude, I had prayed about this like literally multiple times, and I'm not the kind of person that's like you know I just get that like answer. But like, dude, I knew that. I, I thought at the time that I knew that she was the one I was supposed to marry, but I, but what I figured out afterwards was I was just supposed to ask her, right? Because sure. that's what revealed all this darkness. That was sure. But anyway, because of the, I actually felt like I was like, like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like abandoned by God. Sure. <laughs> like I felt, I was like, so like, logically. Why would you do that to Yeah. Me? So I was in a logic place where I was just like, what? Like, 
how is this wrong? Like, what did I do wrong? Right? Like what? And so that's, you're right. That's when emotion takes over. And dude, I went into a, it's funny that summer I was actually, uh, in the best place I'd ever been with sales. I think I was like 80 something accounts ahead of the next person or 60 or something like, like no one was going to, there's no way anybody was going to catch me. Right. Literally after that three and a half weeks of just, I literally stayed in my bedroom and I hardly ate and I hardly slept. And it was like one of the darkest places I've ever been. Yep. But, uh, what's interesting is, and I'm learning this more about myself as we go on, as like life goes on, but I'm, I'm starting to realize that things that I went through as a child, and we don't talk about that now, but it's actually created a resiliency in me. And I think you're the same way. I think you actually have created this resiliency to negativity that is making it so that you can see it from another place. You For can sure. see it in another way. So anyway, I, I just, I see, I see personally kind of where that logic and emotion just battles. And so you were doing like, that's what was happening with you. Your logic and emotion was battling. Yeah. The, yeah. the, the biggest thing that uh, I've learned from this is number one. So yeah, that did happen. It's the worst feeling that, and it's actually the worst thing you can do to anyone. However, right. Because of the way I am, I still talk to her and we have a, actually have a better relationship now than we did then. It took a while. Yeah. Cause I, it was emotionally, I had to get through that. Yeah. But we have a better relationship now. Um, we communicate better than we ever have before. And I was able to move on and find, you know, the love of my life that's everything and more. So going back to your scenario, like in my mind, as I was going through it, I was like, why is this sense. happening to me? Yeah. This Everything's great with the business. Right. We have kids. Like everything was going great. Like yeah. what the freak? But what I, what I learned, even going through that was it was the best thing that ever happened to me it's okay again it's it's the resiliency man it's, yeah it's you being able to see things from a different light and a different angle than anyone else based on the lens that you've created in your life because of sure all of this adversity and all these things that have happened to you which have made you who you are like everybody knows ryan olson as the guy who does not ever accept negativity like in any way shape or form everybody knows that there's like no negativity sure and it's come I, I think, I mean, I, I, I think it's come from all of these different experiences where you basically had to be the person in the group that sees it from a different side. And I, I don't know, would you say that a lot of that stuff that happened really like prepared you for what happened with your marriage as well? A hundred percent, man. Like, to be honest, I've put myself self in situations that most people wouldn't ever experience. And what I mean by that is the whole divorce thing was nuts. The thing we had to go through, but what we overcame and even the relationships I have now are better than they've ever been before. Yeah. So again, um, I look at it as a blessing, you know, and, oh, and for sure, it's the best thing ever. The same example, going back to my outdoor enthusiast life, like just last year. Uh, and this is one of the craziest things that happened to you. I lost a horse. I wasn't on the horse, but I lost a horse all the way down a mountain gone. Like it was dark. It slipped and down a thousand foot ravine, it went gone, disappeared. So, and we were, we were about eight hours away from the truck on horses. Okay. I had my brother and my cousin, which they're outdoors guys, but not like me because of what I've been through. And I had to go down the ravine to find the horse, uh, make sure it was okay, which it was, um, tied up the horse. I had to walk all the way back up the ravine, which took me two hours because I was in probably two feet of snow. Um, and then I had to get them down to the truck. But going through that, we made a campfire and there was some negativity going on in there. Um, you know, my cousin's like, this is freaking nuts. Why are we back here? We shouldn't be back here. My brother was like, hey, like, yeah, but it's going to be okay, you know. And, and I was like, dude, we're fine. Let's build a fire. So we built a fire. I got everyone warm. But we ended up that whole trip going back to get the elk that we had shot, going back up, losing a horse down a ravine, um, getting connected with my brother and my cousin, getting the other horses down to the trailer. It was like about 23 hours from the truck. It took us 23 hours. Mm -hmm. Okay. But one thing that I learned and I continue to learn this is my brother's like, dude, he's like, the second you left us, he's like, I started freaking out. He's like, I, I was freaking out. Like, Dude, we're up here. It's blowing snow. We're freezing cold. Ryan's somewhere down this ravine. I don't see him. But he's like, the second you came back, he's like, I was good. 
And I was like, I was like, well, wh what made you feel like what, what gave you that feeling? Like, why do you feel that way? He's like, dude, he's like, when I'm around you, he's like, you're so positive that I have nothing to worry about. He's like, no matter what, wh whatever situation we're in, you don't worry. And I have a buddy, my, one of my, one of my best friends, Mike Barba. He's like, dude, me and you, our relationship's great. You know why? He goes, cause you don't care about anything and I care about everything. I'm like, what do you mean by that? He's like, dude, we'll go on horse rides and you'll just go down this ravine or cliff. Like it's nothing. And I'm like freaking out, but you're like, we'll be all right. He's like, it's just, a, it's just a different dynamic where he'll be like, ah, we probably shouldn't go down that. I'm yeah, like, just like send it. I'm like, let's go, dude. <laughs> there's a, there's a grizzly bear up a Canyon one time. And these guys were, were coming, running out, freaking out like the grizzly bear. They ran out in front of us. And we had to go up this canyon to get to our camp. We had to get our camp out. And uh, and my my buddy Mike, he's like, uh, he's like, are we gonna go up there? And I'm like, yes. We got we gotta go get our camp, bro. He's like, there's a grizzly bear up there. I'm like, it's fine. We'll be we are we have horses, bro. We'll be fine. So that's just the that's the type of thing that I I, I just I have no fear for some reason, and I don't know why, but. I have no fear and I don't put up with negativity. Well, I think, dude, I think it actually, I, I think it comes from a place of you've had so many things happen that have put you in a super dangerous situation that you've been able to get through that I think you've actually developed this ability to see the, like, not see the future, but like to understand that you're going to come out of this fine. And not only that, you're going to come out of it with a lesson. And it's like, those are the things that I feel like a lot of people struggle with. Like even me with the, broken engagement. Like I thought in the moment I was like, dude, my, my life is, my over. life is over. Like, this is it. But what, you know, what I wish I would have been able to see was Maddie. I wish I would have seen and obviously, right. But I really wish I would have seen what my life was going to be like sure. five, six years from there. It's just like, it's unbelievable. The light at the end of the ten tunnel, right? Like you yeah. seem like you're going through this dark place. And then I think the difference is there's two things that I noticed just as listening to you is number one, you're able to see that light at the end of the tunnel that nobody else can see in the darkest times. And then the other thing is you said something that was interesting. You said when you're in that situation with your brother and your cousin and everything, like you calm them down and you're just like, dude, let's just, let's make a fire. And I got them warm, right? It's cliche or is like, uh, whatever you want to say, this sounds like, dude, that's what you do. You're, you've developed this ability to be in the, in groups of people who are just so negative and like, chomping at the bit of all the things that could be wrong you make them warm bro like you bring in that warmth and that positivity of knowing like it's going to be okay like this sucks right now but trust sure. me like it will be okay we'll yeah. get through it and i think that's really uh something that is i think that's a trait that a lot of people don't have and i think that's what makes you who you are and obviously it's come from countless experiences where you've had to do that mm -hmm. yeah for sure it's, it's, uh, it's insane. And I'm not going to say it's, it's been easy. I mean, of course you, I still have negative thoughts. I still, I, I can still see negativity. I, I still think negativity, but for whatever reason, especially around individuals, I, I find the good, man. I find the good in everything. And it just, it, it, it makes life so much easier. Some, sometimes it pisses people off because they're like, bro, they just want you to can be you negative. please be negative? Can you it's so true. I've been in so many. Can you drop an F bomb, like, please? Dude, please just be angry for once. They're like, can you just get pissed? And I do. I get pissed. Like I do. I have a passion side. Yeah, but right? you're like a positive pissed. It's weird. Uh, I mean, I, you're I, like happy pissed. I'll be. I'll be like. I can go like crazy pissed, and then I can like flip it around and be like, okay, the reason why I was pissed was was because X, Y, and Z. But this is why. Uh, I'm like I'm like an Ian Went on positivity versus cells, dude. It's crazy. So. Um, well, Hey, let's finish this off by, uh, I always ask the, the person just simply like, what's, I guess, one piece of advice. If you had to give one piece of advice to everyone listening to this, uh, what would it be? Dude, it, it's, to me, it's simple in life. You're going to have adversity. You're going to have challenges. You're going to have people tell you, you can't do things. You're going to have family members that you may be emotionally attached to that will tell you, you shouldn't do this or that's not possible, but it's going to happen. And those are the hardest ones is when you're physically attached to somebody. 
the, the advice that I can give anyone and everyone is surround yourself with positive people. And if you can't surround yourself with positive people, be that positive person. Because what you'll find and what I've found is that I can take a group of individuals that are super negative and you give me time and they become positive. And what positive does is it drives results. All negativity does, if you, if you look at negativity, all negativity does is, is you lose results, okay? Uh, I give the example all the time. I, we're driving down the road, people get massive road rage. Some people flip people off, right? All that's doing is driving yourself to be negative. Where I, in my mind, I'm like, okay, maybe they're having a bad day. Maybe they woke up today and uh, they had an emergency in a hospital or maybe their dad died. You don't know what's going on with them. So what I say is look at the world as uh, a playground. And what I mean by a playground is everyone has their own challenges. Everyone has their own issues. But if you can be the person that can look at a situation and turn it into a positive, you're going to surround yourself not, not only by positive people, but you're also going to grow faster than anyone. Um, and so that's why I'm always talking about positivity, man. Like even in our kickoff, dude, I, the power of positivity, mm -hmm. I could go on and on and on about what that does for people. Yeah. So it's, it's a big deal. Well, you can, you can take a positive person and put him in a situation in a retail environment, in a door knocking environment, in correlation, and it, it literally will blow people's minds like, dude, that guy right there, that's who I want to be around. Mm -hmm. That's just what you need to do and you'll grow. Makes sense. You guys heard it. Well, Ryan, thank you for being on the podcast. Uh, I think this has been awesome. Um, I'm sure you got more stories to tell. So if anybody wants to hear, just... Bro, that's just the... Where do they find you, bro? That's, that's just the touch. Where do they find you? They can find me via freaking Instagram. Instagram? What's your uh, Instagram? I don't even know, bro. It's like at Ryan Olson 3. I, you, you I would think probably, that's what it is, Ryan Olson 3. Yeah. Ian will throw it up on there. I'll throw it up on there. Uh, you can find me uh, on Facebook, and you can actually just probably just call me. Okay. That's pretty easy. Just put your phone number right on there for anybody. Just put my phone number call. out. Hit me up. All right. I usually answer. If I don't answer, I'll call you back. It's one of my weird things I have to do. So, yeah. Kim would be able to tell you. Kim would be able to tell you. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. All right. Cool. Okay, Ryan. Thanks, brother. Thanks, bro. Appreciate yeah. it.